Okay, welcome everyone. So it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Professor <coughs> Saraswati Vishwishwara, who is actually an honorary scientist at the National Academy of Sciences in India. Um, she is visiting us from the Molecular Biophysics Unit from the Indian Institute of Sciences in Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Vishwaswara is actually an old friend of the group. We, many of us remember her from the time that she was visiting us regularly when Klaus was around and to discuss for ideas for collaboration, et cetera. By way of introduction, uh, after her initial training in Bangalore, she obtained actually a PhD in quantum chemistry when uh, she worked with Professor David Beveridge, some of you might know her, in, the City University of New York. And then uh, he, she did a postdoc with the late Professor John Popel, the Nobel Laureate at the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And then she went back and became a faculty at the Indian Institute of Sciences in Bangalore, where she went through the rank ranks and actually she became uh, members of two Academy of Sciences in India, actually. Just for your information, this whole institute was founded by the famous Ramachandran that all of you know. <laughs> so so uh, as far as her work is concerned, she has been very interested in applying network modeling for biomolecular structure, for protein structures specifically, and that's a subject that we're going to see today as well, looking at the structure, dynamics, function of proteins, how they interact with each other, and so on and so forth. So she has spent actually her whole career on this idea. And uh, we look forward to hear more about what you have been up to lately. Thank you very much for coming all the way. Should I say from India or from Lewis? <laughs> Looking forward to your seminar, please. Oh yeah. Thank you, Imad and uh, Dr. Charles Schroeder. Uh, it's really very nice of you to invite me here. Uh, yeah, as uh, Imad mentioned, it's not the first time I'm coming here. I have been here earlier several times. Can you hear me? Earlier when uh, Klaus Schulten was there, and that's one person I'm missing in this time when I'm giving the talk here. He used to be extremely nice, and then we used to have a lot of uh, interaction with him a couple of times when I came here. So uh, anyway, it's a great pleasure to meet all of you, and uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to the talk. Well, um, uh, Today, I'm going to give an overview of, the, of our work, connectivity in protein structures, structure networks from atomic to global levels. Uh, this is our institute, Indian Institute of Science, which we, uh, it's more than a century old. Um, and the, our department uh, is somewhere close by. It's the main, main uh, building in the institute. So uh, here, maybe our focus as my point out more from to zoom, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Click on that. Or page up right now. Oh, there you go. Uh, so, um, what do we mean by connectivity? Here we have from theoretical foundation for protein sequence to structure, uh, as Iman mentioned, 
most of you are familiar with uh, what Ramachandran thought is, and uh, this is uh, one of the earlier uh, reference Ramachandran, Ramakrishnan, and uh, his collaborators. Uh, uh, what this shows here is uh, if you take a sequence of protein, then uh, structurally what is allowed as a pi side map, only a limited area of the uh, of, of this uh, possibility, it, it can give rise, it can, it is allowed, it's called allowed the region. And then most of them are of the indices of beta sheets and turns. Uh, this was the great contribution uh, of uh, Ramachandran. Of course, he had other great contributions on uh, uh, collagen structure, triple helical structure around the same time when the double helical DNA structure came uh, uh, during the approximately time. So, but then this has really stood the test of time. You can probably, uh, all of you have used it as part of your uh, packages to check, go check, and uh, many other uh, ways of looking at it. So, so in fact, uh, last month, we celebrated Jail Ramachandran's centenary. Uh, the, of course, we wanted to have a full in-person meeting, but it happened to be only the institute people in person, but uh, uh, other people uh, appeared so. So that's uh, Ramachandran map. Main thing here is a uh, three dimensional backbone fold uh, is uh, characterized by Ramachandran map. So the question we want to ask is that was backbone. Backbone, similar to this backbone, can we look at side chain connectivity in protein structures? So DNR map has elegantly provided this the underlying principles to comprehend the global one level, what about side chain connectivity? So here I'm just uh, something like this. You have all the side chains interacting with each other, but at the same time, you this forms a cluster, this another forms another cluster region, the other cluster region. This is what we have been trying to look at. Uh, is there any principle or are there any methods to characterize these things has been the work we have been pursuing for a long time. Uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about. So when you talk about connectivity in macromolecules like uh, proteins or other uh, macromolecules, we start with chemical bonds. That is connectivity between pairs of atoms or the group of, the group of atoms. They are covalent, strong, sharing electrons. Whereas what we are looking at connectivity in macromolecules like in structures, of course, the backbone scaffold is there, secondary and supersecondary structures, as given by GNR plot. And most of it is non-covalent, like non-covalent pairwise connectivity, hydrogen bond, bisulfide bridges, van der Waal forces, and so on. Uh, of course, uh, if it's only electronic, there is a way of having an extended connectivity like resonance structures or uh, what you can see here. But it can really not take up the entire connectivity. So how can we define non-covalent global connectivity of protein sites explicitly at that point in time? Uh, so what you have, uh, the approach that we have taken global connectivity through concepts borrowed from other disciplines, graphs, network theory, basic network metrics, communication in network metrics, like uh, Kirchhoff's metrics and so on. Quantum chemistry, electron delocalization as in the uh, conjugated molecules, eigenstates elucidated from solution to chemistry metrics. And then statistical physics, we take concepts of population phenomena, and uh, transition preparation, transition point of uh, protein dynamics, which this, of course, is uh, uh, something important 
to characterize proteins, uh, so whether it is equilibrium, non-equilibrium, or the ensemble, or everything. Uh, this is important. Um, by the way, your uh, some of the references I'm doing, I have made here. You can see this is SM Vishveshwara. It's uh, Vishveshwara. So SM Vishveshwara, Svita Vishveshwara is uh, sitting here. In order to distinguish between S Vishveshwara and S Vishveshwara, <laughs> I still have to figure out what exactly to say. I have just put SM Vishveshwara. <laughs> uh, in the context of quantum chemistry, of course, as I must mention, uh, my training was with the uh, uh, beverage uh, as approximate molecular orbital theory. It was just beginning dynamics at that time, but most of it was uh, in our, our quantum chemistry. And then it's Popper, he was very well known already for overlapping high electrons, conjugated molecules, that's PPT formalism. And the wave functions are constructed of uh, of uh, linear combination of atomic particles. So in some sense, the wave function that you are looking at is each atom, different orbitals, they are put together and you make a wave function. Uh, that is kind of very appealing even here. Sometimes when we construct the matrix, we take all the connections uh, and make use of the methods used in these cases. And the element of quantum chemistry to handle large complex molecules. Now everybody uses Gaussian program, Gaussian um, and many other programs, but uh, the, using the atomic orbitals. So the program has become a tool for chemists and biologists to study all kinds of systems. Uh, by the way, this cartoon was drawn by Pujar Bangalore. What uh, we did was he had seen Pope, but I just showed him a picture. And then, uh, he, of course, he used to draw cartoons for the planetarium in Bangalore, the outreach uh, one. And uh, most of the time, uh, planetarium used to get cartoons drawn by him. So I said, why not do for Pope also? So here he's uh, reading in the equations and whether it's interstellar molecules. Uh, or uh, buckyball, whatever, uh, they, they all could get interest in us. Um, okay, so with this background, the outline of the presentation, first I talk about construction of the structure networks, and then allosteria theory and paths of communications explored through structure network and protein dynamics, graph spectral scoring scheme of weighted protein structure, side chain network, and applications to structure comparison. Then also I'll talk a little bit about fluctuations in structures and their coordination with functions. And finally, try to see whether we can say something about side chain networks in COVID-19. Uh, uh, is there time? Of construction of protein structure network and lessons from uh, lessons and insights from uh, uh, this network here. Uh, just to give a brief account, we have the backbone here, and then the side chains are uh, given R1, uh, uh, Ri, R plus minus one, plus two, and so on and so forth. And uh, these are the side chains. So here the backbone. If, uh, is uh, something which you can take, and the side chain uh, you can separately take, or you just take the C alpha atom of that. Uh, you can construct uh, a matrix. For example, if you take this example here, the side chain network, or well, again, you can have different strengths of interaction where the, how many atoms of residue I and how many atoms of residue J is interacting. And of course, it's normalized so that uniformity is the same thing here. So here you can you have graphical and matrix representation of protein structure. It's not restricted only to proteins. You can use uh, other cases here. It's a bipartite graph of protein and nucleic acids. Even here, you can follow similar procedure 
and you can get protein really well targeted. Just to go a little bit into the detail, how you quantify non covalent interactions at atomic level. Nodes are the amino acid side chains, edges are non covalent connections between the two. So, here, if you take this is the backbone, and the side chains are coming up here, two residues are interacting, making n number of contacts. Uh, so, that's one parameter which we need. And we take from the database what would be the maximum uh, that a particular residue would make. So that will be used for normalization. So from that, we can construct the interaction strength uh, using this equation, very simple equation. So at some value of, uh, I mean, six, we get these clusters connected to each other. So it's there by they are seeing anything that is. Uh, equal to greater than six percent that we have set forms a cluster here. Um, so here, this is the method that we are using. But of course, you can use other methods also. For example, Miyazawa genetic potential. Again, all of you know based uh, on positive chemical approximation, uh, you can derive pairwise potentials for uh, twenty by twenty amino acids. And we ourselves have used, uh, uh, rather than computing geometrical uh, uh, positions, force fields like uh, based uh, on energy based, we can use the, that also as a weight, uh, connectivity or uh, intensity of weight. Of course, we have used this a lot because it's very simple to do if you have good structure. When the coordinates are good, we can really get, uh, we don't have to do much for that. Okay, once we construct that, how do we use the percolation studies? We find that it uh, assists in choosing approximate ID. So if you really look at the behavior of uh, interaction strength versus the size of the largest cluster, uh, most of the most of the time, it's like a sigmoid curve. We have here; it has a collection of uh, different number of uh, amino acids in um, different sizes of proteins. Uh, so here, each one, this is one size, uh, another size, third size, and so on. Here we can know uh, uh, again I win versus uh, size of the largest cluster. We can convert it into uh, the probability function. And so this is, uh, the I mean is kind of the probability of connection. Uh, here you can come up with the uh, uh, percolation point here. So more or less it's somewhere in this uh, region and uh, that can be it. And uh, that is where uh, we took Smitha's help along with our colleagues, our uh, students, um, uh, through both there and Brenda, uh, they all worked towards the concepts development here. Uh, well, once we use that, what, what, what does it tell us? We looked at the uh, backbone, for example, or side chain we are looking at here. If you look at the backbone part of it, you can see that uh, this is the real protein uh, profile that we looked at, size of the largest plus of the last community here. And then if you take completely random uh, values of the same set, uh, something like Erdos Lenin's uh, values, this is where it is, uh, this is the shape that it's taking. It's really in the regime of protein structures that we are looking at, it's not, it's just reaching somewhere here. And the others are constrained random, where we put some constraints similar to the geometry of proteins, and then they are close to the real one here. Now, if you really look at the side chain, no matter what you do, none of these will raise up here at all, random ones that we're looking at. Only the protein one goes like this, and uh, the, the others do not. 
pressure up to that variability case. So this has been something which we have refined really very nice way of characterizing protein structures in terms of uh, topological uh, communities. This is an example of Tim Barron, where uh, you see these uh, communities of a, a definite and kind of specific connections are uh, really shown. So we, we can kind of look at universality of click percolation in side chain networks. So based on side chain, it, uh, their signature are characterized by a large degree of community than in random networks. The degree distribution and the bond percolation behavior on the other hand, if you are just looking at only the degree distribution or bond uh, percolation, they are reminiscent of random network model to some degree that I didn't show this, that result uh, of this one. Thus, unique structural protein seems to emerge from an interplay between random and selected features. Uh, here, I think it's important to, uh, I mean, this is a hypothesis, but we find that there is some support for this kind of hypothesis because if you really look at uh, the number of folds that we see in protein structures of millions of sequences, there are only about a few hundreds of uh, folds. Uh, that can actually accommodate very, very large number of uh, sequences. So in the, you, you will have many, many different ways of fitting them. And so that is where the random uh, connect. It's the connections that we are looking at. But the two uh, sequence position may be different. The amino acid in sequence may be different, but some other matching one will come here. And uh, so this is uh, really something we have been working on. OK, so after constructing what do we I saw one of this picture outside in your gallery. I'm not good at your uh, uh, dynamics and the beautiful picture, so I'm, I'm sticking to all the uh, static pictures here. Uh, TRNA synthetase, uh, this is a protein where you have the catalytic domain, anticodon region, region binding domain, there are about 70 ions are separated, and TRNA is connecting from here to here. So the communication between the anticodon region and the active site region, it's crucial for the faithful translation of the epigenetic code. So this has to happen. How does that happen? It's actually, uh, uh, well, just, just uh, as a digression, parts of communication. We look at uh, parts of communication, we come across parts of communication, not just in biological protein uh, cases, it's a universal problem in a number of disciplines uh, with complex networks. Electrical communication, network of metabolic parts, transmission of viruses in community, whatever you are looking at, if you know the parts of communication, you understand the system much better. So in biological function, when the bio, bio functions achieved through allosteric communication, that's action at a distance, within and across both. So in the present context, investigations through protein side chain network provides the information on the parts of communication. So here we combine our, the, our network with uh, simulations, a lot of simulations done on different PRNA uh, bound and uh, different uh, ligand bound various uh, uh, simulations we carry out. So they use from dynamic cross correlation from MD simulations. They identify shortest paths connected through non covalent interactions. You have the uh, active site and the TRNA binding site. We, in fact, find four different paths in this particular case. This was done a long time ago. And those are shown in four different colors too here. So literally, you can pick up the parts from one side to another. 
Uh, they also uh, came up with an automated approach to network features. Um, and uh, you, this is ensemble. It could be a dissimulation or a collection of snapshots uh, all put together. Uh, we can come up with uh, parts of communications. And then, of course, we still need to have some domain knowledge. We want to say what's the source and what's the sink. It could be as one one point to another point, or a domain here and another domain here. All this uh, can be a dynamic. Uh, this was done uh, when uh, my student, Madhuri Bhattacharya, was a PhD student. And currently, she's a faculty at Yale. Of course, she worked on uh, experiments with John Kurian after that. Now she has both the uh, expertise. Uh, then adaptation of graph spectral method to produce uh, structured networks and application to structure compliance. Uh, recently, recently, within the past five years, developments in graph spectral methods uh, in terms of uh, how you can take a weighted matrix, get the solution, uh, all the, and additionally, the computational power has increased so much, and you can do a lot of involved uh, uh, computations. So we use graph spectral theory, which is able to capture uh, the global features with minimal loss of uh, information. Understanding protein folding function is an area which will benefit from graph spectral theory. So in general, network comparison algorithms are essential to capture similarities, dissimilarities between different networks, of course, not restricted only to protein structure networks. Uh, I just spend a little bit of time in how to make this. Uh, network similarities score. Basically, you want to compare different networks. How are you going to compare? And then we need some quantity to measure that. So the network similarities score, we, we, we come up with different components with uh, edge. Uh, and, uh, this, of course, is like a child coefficient, where difference in the edge weights are taken up as edge uh, change, edge difference score. But here, what we do is cluster level change, eigenvalue weighted cluster, that's the cosine sign. Uh, if it's one, it's very high, or uh, zero. And the global change correspondence score. What we do here is each of the eigen vectors we compare with all the other ones and then pick up the best ones and then take the average of that. So that would mean that you have really explored all possible ways to capture the best. So with this, we have uh, done some. Uh, calculations and show that. This can also be used for uh, finding out the perturbation score, network perturbation score or edge perturbation score, evaluated by systematic deletion of load, uh, load or edge in the connected matrix. So you take the original matrix and then go on systematically deleting, find uh, the difference in uh, those uh, values between the two cases. So you can get H, for example, here, edge perturbation score, and this is from the, the particular case and the minimum that you see in the whole set. Um, this is again here. So this is also something we have been using. Uh, this uh, significance, as I already mentioned, this is kind of pictorially depicted here. When you say edge difference, in this particular case, only one contact between these two residues. In this case, seven contacts are there. So that accounts for edge difference. Cosine score, sort of local uh, differences between pick up between the two vectors that you're looking at. The correspondence score will, it's a global alignment of each vector with the other one. And uh, that's what it's in this feature here. Uh, so this was also the perspective 
you can see in the JCIM. So, if we comparison of protein structures, you can do the same protein with different population variations. It could be uh, uh, ensemble that you have obtained from simulation, or it could be different migrated states and then in uh, crystal structures or uh, Kyrie and wherever you have, you have a whole collection of structures. So, but the protein is the same that you can do. Uh, and this was, this is not done, but uh, it is under progress. One of the students and my student is working on that. But this one, same protein combination variation, I'll show you some results. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, about the flag. Uh, have you is this something that is evolutionary conserved? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. the, the, the essentially uh, you have uh, in one organism you have uh, I mean they perform the same function. Right, right. Their structures are very very similar. Right. But uh, in one one organism uh, it is uh, like you take one organism. Uh, there will be a few. Changes in the analysis there. They're homologous in terms of sequence. Uh, even that need not be there if they're not homologous, but if, if it attains the same four, there is again something one can look at. But we, we are not talking about it. It's the same protein, the changes in, the, in some regions of the sequence. So examples, I'll show examples of G protein coupled receptor and HIV proteins. Uh, uh, this is, of course, I'm sure all of you are familiar with G protein coupled receptors, which are ubiquitous in nature. Some 800 or so structures are already around in the functions are already known, and they are in different. Uh, uh, cells, different organisms, uh, including humans. Is very important. So here, uh, this is one example. We look at beta two adrenergic receptor. You have the membrane. Uh, again, it reminds me of the, the pictures that I saw outside here. Uh, extracellular transmembrane region. Uh, this is coupled to G protein here. So you have G alpha, beta, and uh, nanobodies are also. So we performed uh, network similarity score in this particular case. So this is, we sort the nodes of the feedler vector. We are not, for this representation, we will take the feedler vector, which is the second lowest eigenvalue, which gives the clustering information in case. So that is the sorted one. And the vector component, this is an agonist bound case and antagonist form case. So the protein is the same, but the ligands are different. Now, uh, this, this is one cluster, this is another cluster, and so on. In some, here it's at least, we have made it appear separate by removing many of the ones which are not uh, really uh, redundant. But for sometimes it may not be so smooth. Then it becomes difficult to find out which cluster we where is the bond in the cluster. But anyway, coming to these clusters that we have looked at uh, in the two cases, what we see in the agonist uh, case, uh, small change. Main thing is small changes in the nitrate. These are happening mainly because of that. Because this bonds slightly differently from the other one that will perturb the in interaction in the, in the neighborhood and it percolates further down. And that gives rise to the kind of clusters that we see here, the blue one, red one, and so on. So give rise to reorganization, several clusters connect the extracellular and intracellular. In the case of uh, uh, agonist bond case, but in this case, it will not really allow. Uh, I mean, there is no good path connecting the same <clears throat> uh, that, That's about beta 2 identity <coughs> receptor. Now, the perturbation scores, if you look at here, 
top score respects the age perturbations in three different conformations of masculinity receptors, um, uh, receptor bond antagonist, agonist, and uh, agonist plus modulator. Modulators also help uh, in uh, actually reorienting the cycles that we are looking at. So, this uh, we are plotting here the top 10 uh, edges which are uh, responsible for the education. And then here we are looking at HIV protease with uh, known perturbation. And we find these ones are the ones top perturbation. Interestingly, you can see that HIV protease acts as a timer, and most of the perturbed uh, perturbing nodes are at the dynamic region. Uh, this can be uh, obtained from these calculations. Okay, so the next section, fluctuations in structures and the correlation <clears throat> function. This has been extensive now, now uh, that has been the aim of uh, many structural biologists to see that when you see some fluctuations in an ensemble, how to correlate, or is there any correlation to begin with, with function? So uh, I just picked up one of the latest uh, um, review by Vit Bahar, which gives uh, a good account of uh, here, the, there are looking at uh, assessing uh, 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 recent methods for uh, hybrid simulations. Coarse grain, uh, not coarse grain, GNM combined with uh, atomic cases. But uh, there are many studies which have already been done before. So, this is the one which we took up. I thought I would uh, let you know about it. Um, this is actually just been out in this uh, current research in structural biology, a new journal which is coming up. Uh, uh, started by Tom Landon. Um, so, uh, fourth problem is so coming back here. Uh, this has been kind of uh, uh, mixed feelings I have because this is Srinivasan, is one of the authors of the paper uh, done by Prasunera, my student, a dear student, and Prabhanti, who is a joint student between Srinivasan and uh, myself. We were almost, uh, by the way, Srinivasan is uh, coming from G.N. Ramachandran lineage. He's the academic grandson of G.N. Ramachandran. So you can see he's a uh, <coughs> Unfortunately, a few months ago, he passed away. It's kind of a uh, dedication also to him. Uh, this paper we had written, Srinivasan. So what we have done in this space is, again, taken very high resolution X-ray structures in the database of many proteins, of ligand bound of different kinds or different uh, environment, whatever. And then you look at the RMSD between them and then compute all versus all network scoring scheme. And, uh, then we wanted to see is there any new message we can obtain from this. So, uh, this is actually the um, graphical abstract of the paper. Insights from variability, uh, high resolution protein structure. Uh, by the way, here it's called NDS, network dissimilarity score, because Srinivasan was very particular. We have to call it dissimilarity because when you are comparing, <coughs> Uh, it's this similarity is what you are measuring. I said, okay, let's make it into something. So here, what's plotted uh, uh, is our MST and then network similarity score. Uh, we you can see that even when RMS RMST is small, the similarity score can uh, take different values. We can depending on which comparison we are making here. For example, uh, in this particular region, same RMSD, we can see uh, blown up 
two different proteins. Uh, what you see in uh, this is, I don't remember which protein it is. Uh, I can't see. Anyway, the two different forms, uh, uh, I think it's what I've seen. In the two different forms, the differences are captured at the edge difference. Here you can see how in the in the protein, the small region when you blow up, these are the two interacting residues, for example, can take up the and giving rise to difference in the edge ratio. I mean, I mean, it's only one of them is shown, but it's true of all interactions. And that's how it will uh, change the connectivity uh, from one region to another region. You can ask it, yeah. How do you treat disulfide bonds? Or is that something? Um, disulfide bonds, <coughs> we just take it as disulfide. Most of the time, they don't change. I mean, yeah, unless it has gone into uh, hydrolysis or something. Like this one. So um, that disulfide uh, is kept as the gene, essentially. So it will show up the same way throughout. So you treat it as a covalent bond? Cover, yeah, if it forms a disulfide, it will become a covalent bond. But there are cases, you know, there may be some four, eight uh, uh, SH groups, which may, uh, there are many, many possibilities under different conditions. Maybe one will detach and another one will come close. All those things can happen. But if it remains the same, essentially it's a solid. It will be high interaction strength thought. Well, so this is uh, what, from those analyses, what we did was uh, categorize proteins based on uh, maybe I'll, I'll show you. The, it's okay. Next, next picture I show you what data set we have taken. So, taking this large uh, data set of uh, single domain uh, proteins with different bomb systems, you can classify uh, this is RMST versus uh, network dissimilarity score as low network variation rigid or high network. Uh, your variable network, flexible uh, network, or uh, your preserved uh, network, and they're mixed. Essentially, we use some criteria to see how to categorize the, these, um, like how what percentage of the, this we are uh, falling into this region. So you can see that. By and large, you can make classification of proteins into either it is very rigid or it's rigid at the backbone level, but it can vary at the side chain level or it can you know, vary at both levels and uh, some of them will uh, not changing the ADS, but changing the RMSD and so on. So only thing here is the question comes, what about uh, intrinsically disordered proteins? Intrinsically disordered proteins, we deliberately did not take them because that goes into a different region. Only when it binds to something like uh, some other partner, then it will acquire the structure. So what we have taken here made sure that we don't come into that uh, kind of uh, region. So it's all completely, only a few small loops changing of uh, that, that kind of, um, yeah, that this is actually what uh, data set, multiple crystal structures, single domain of monomeric proteins, uh, total 56 proteins, uh, protein-wise 56, pretty free, we came up with the 900 points in each one, very anyway, minimum is five. Minimum what we are getting is five, five to 20, 30, or even a little more in case of crisis and so on. Uh, so the number of comparisons would be of this order per thousand. This is a simple variance uh, expression that we use. 
So you can get the H rate fluctuation. So the H rate fluctuation, previous one is NDS, but you can also look at H rate fluctuation. Okay, so that, that is uh, edge rates. If you really want to see whether fluctuations in edge rates are connected to function or whatever, you can quantitatively obtain edge rates. Um, then coming to the last section, sidechain networks in SARS CoV 2 complex. Uh, this is a trimeric structure. There are two trimeric structures. One is backbone, uh, one is uh, closed, and the other one is uh, partial. Case. That uh, are shown in two different colors. When we, after we performed, uh, actually, we didn't perform simulation by ourselves. What we did was uh, there was already. Uh, uh, simulation trajectories available by the uh, research trajectories of uh, something like uh, 10 microseconds. And the nice thing about this is they're putting everything like the glycons that are there, the whole system is equilibrated for a very long time. So, whatever we have taken, we are confident that uh, it's a good equilibrated structure. Uh, so, from these results, what we see asymmetries exhibited by sidechain network parameters of streaks and communities are tightly packed primary interface in the receptor uh, um, binding domain region in closed state, which are lost in the partial interface state. More interestingly, network parameters at site. Uh, distant from receptor binding domain, also differ in two states, reflecting the effect of global connectivity. So it's almost like uh, allosteria, which you can see. Uh, this is actually at the gross uh, um, uh, mesoscopic level. This is the average parameter that we have seen. Uh, largest cluster profile, which we have seen earlier. Uh, you can see that there are changes in the transition region in, compared to the partially open and the closed state. So, uh, in fact, these are the interesting regions where we see a very large number of residues remaining uh, uh, there for a long time. Um, so, that is the uh, average property that you are looking at. But then, if you are looking at uh, Dynamically stable clicks in come even this is also from average property. So here the uh, interfacial clicks uniques between the three chains that we are looking at is what we are doing. So here, this is the neck region and this is the end region which gets cut off and then uh, gets fused to the other side of the membrane. So between the two cases, you can see that the, in the open, in, in this case, that is the closed state, at the neck region, it's held tighter compared to this one. And at this region, you see more connectivity in partially open case. So there are this flexibility that is taking place in the general structure. Okay, so now you may ask um, um, what happens here, but in progress, we are still working on this one uh, with SARS-CoV-2 spike protein with human based interception. That, that was just SARS-CoV-2 protein and with ACE2 receptor. The connectivity map, we are trying to get a connectivity map of the complex at a time. We use our network uh, features and then see which one is connected to which one. I'm focusing mainly, mostly on the um, interface region, interaction between the S2 receptor and then the um, spike protein. What a lot of work has been done, even computationally, a lot of work has come out in the last. Uh, over time, 
Uh, but we still think this will be a novel way of looking at it because uh, most of them are uh, general network parameters. I would say that here in the hub, here is uh, some other feature and so on. But what we are trying to do is residue residue level wise, how is it uh, connected? That is what we are looking at. So analysis of MD average fluctuations, uh, this is fluctuation, we are actually looking at uh, fluctuations also. Throughout the simulation, we are looking at uh, which of the edges are fluctuating more, which of them are not fluctuating. So it's a 2D map of uh, interaction strength versus fluctuations. And uh, how does uh, this R scope 2 interaction differ? compared to the old SART one. That is what we are trying to do. Uh, so interface characterization in terms of network parameters. I don't want to disappoint you by not showing any kind of uh, map. Uh, instead, I'll just show the SARS code to the old SARS, SARS code one complex with the receptor. This is just one uh, sample that uh, we have got here. The interface cluster, the blue ones are the uh, ACE2 receptor, and the red ones are from SARS CoV old. Um, the green has the <coughs> interaction between them. Yeah. See, you can always ask, don't we see that in the crystal structure? Don't we see that in the chiral um, or on the other things? But what we see is paired ones. You just see this particular residue is connected with this complex and so on and so forth. But what we want to look at is, I think, as much a connected global level as possible. So in this particular case, this is what uh, the connectivity throughout we have got, two of them have come. And then apart from uh, the direct connections, they also themselves are connected to peaks and communities. That is, actually, this is a place. The ones with red here, uh, it's not just that particular residue, but it, it will form sometimes some clicks and connected clicks. That is what you see here. So uh, this is what we are hoping to achieve in the next couple of months. I, Thank you, Mona. We will that. Okay, so I'm coming to uh, summarize the key points that I've uh, mentioned here is emphasis on the importance of global connectivity of side chains and structures, connectivity definitions based on the input from the data set of proteins, mathematical interactions between the CDUs. Choice of optimal connectivity using statistical physics. Then we have uh, shown how you can use mathematical concepts such as graph spectra, the tools to handle weighted connectivity metrics, which we have introduced, but uh, comparison case, comparison of uh, different networks. Connectivity map of protein complex at atomic level. Communication between selected regions within and across proteins, which are crucial for function. Then, summary the identification of residues crucial to hold the network and to participate in the communication can stimulate experimentalists to design experiments and interpret their results in a much more quantitative way. I just end with my acknowledgement. Oh, this is uh, actually those who have contributed to most of the work which I uh, presented here. This this one, Shinivasan, uh, uh, this is the academic grandson of uh, Jim Ramachandran, who passed away recently. And Prabhantu is the one who worked on the uh, NDA score, Prabhantu. So Vasundhara has been working on uh, from the beginning on network scores for this scheme in this paper as well as this of course you can recognize me as here. And um, Maitreyi, I told you about uh, she 
is from uh, Yale University. Um, so Varsha is a Smita student. She's doing all the uh, fluctuations and uh, the largest trust of her life. She wishes she's doing that. Anushka is a Madhuri student, Harina is a student. Apart from this, of course, there are a lot more people who are involved. I won't go into detail, but definitely I'm very happy that uh, Imad and Thals uh, gave me an opportunity to present our uh, work here. Thanks so much. Our uh, contributions to concepts program Algorithms, this I already mentioned, all the collaborators. Previously, many, many of them have worked. Kandan, who is <coughs> at Georgia, uh, 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 at Athens, Georgia, is a professor there. Uh, Brinda is at uh, PDP place. And many of them have contributed. And then the co collaborators from our own institute, uh, this. Uh, Surolia and uh, um, Deepankar, they are actually experimentalists. They wanted some information on uh, the uh, system that mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, protein, particular one. And that's where uh, this is Deepankar mycobacterium tuberculosis protein. Surolia is on lectin. He is a lectin man. He's crystallized and he's studied enormous amount of the lectins which are related to immune system kind of problems. So we have worked, they have, they approached us for uh, uh, network calculations. Uh, Narasuma, she has actually taken all kinds of uh, systems biology studies. She's in the back. This is actually a special case of Professor Anand Solutions from mechanical engineering. He really wanted to check sequences random, I mean, which sequence is stable and which one is not. For that, we together uh, looked at uh, the interaction strength, how you can proceed. Uh, he had this mathematical knowledge of uh, performing analytical function. So this, uh, I come from Indian Institute of Science. Uh, so I thank all these uh, funding agencies. And uh, National Academy, it's like uh, academic sciences here. Yeah, I, mean, I thank them. Thank you all so much, really, uh, for uh, listening to this talk. This one who has interest in read this uh, relation by Pandya. Thank you very much. No, you are perfect. If I don't time, we started a few minutes late actually because of technology. Thank you very much. So, time for questions. So, you almost addressed all of my questions in your last four slides. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I can start actually. Yes. So, how about protein protein interaction? You mentioned H2 RBD already. I guess, I mean, the same principle should apply. You know, if they work within the protein, they should work between proteins as well. Is that, that's is a very good question and very important question mm -hmm. because that's how <clears throat> information is transferred right. from one place to another. They interact with each other. Right. What we had earlier, about 10 years ago, we had taken the protein complexes, whatever mm -hmm. was available yeah. at the protein complexes, and we characterized the interface for them. Uh, there again, we got uh, different, depending on the complex, we have got strong ones, weak right. ones, and we were able to characterize them in terms of clusters and so on. But that 10 years ago, now uh, the protein uh, yeah. data has exponentially increased. We are planning to right. take it out. Uh, one other thing we noticed is the population profile that I mentioned. This is single domain. That's what we have looked at. Right. So we are very much interested in seeing what happens when you say complex. Yeah. In fact, we are seeing that with, uh, with the, uh, the percolation transition profile, 
uh, there are a lot of interesting things which come in that region. Uh, here, what I showed here was only trimeric, which was not uh, separate out too much, and it was an average uh, one that I had taken. Right. But we are looking at individual snapshots, and the individual snapshot, one snapshot would show up to some point similar population, then their uh, profile changes in the other cases. And even snapshot by snapshot, the profile changes because there's change in the competition between the two cases. But that, that's yeah. very important. Definitely an area to go into more. Charles, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Thank you very much for the talk. So the synthetic chemists are, are getting better at synthesizing, you know, sequence defined uh, synthetic polymers. Yeah. And so I wonder, you know, this seems to be a very powerful framework. You know, beyond proteins, even if you could, you know, apply and import some of these techniques to sequence defined synthetic materials. Synthetic made out of proteins or binding. To Just different. So it could be a different chemistry backbone. It could be different side groups, non the non standard amino acids, non -standard, even or yeah, something but like that. It could be a protein sequence. It could be. Uh, it doesn't have to be a peptide, peptide backbone. Peptide it could be even a carbon carbon backbone or something. Yeah. It would be really interesting. Actually. Uh, you know, although I talk so much about protein because it's of interest to us, you could uh, uh, do that for this maybe and show one slide. Uh, this may help you here. Mm -hmm. This was uh, a model compound. This, when we were developing the method, we wanted to see uh, like the eigenvector of the Correspondence score versus uh, cosine score and so on. We we were doing this kind of uh, study. Took some model uh, structure A and structure B, which are very similar. But what are the differences? Where have it uh, come? So it's not need not be protein at all. Right. It need not be uh, carbon at all. So if you want to uh, look at any system, this method can be quite helpful. I guess they are biased by Ramachandra. I guess that's true. <laughs> but even on even, the institute, that's right. <laughs> even on the project that you that's and I work on, right? Yeah, right. yeah it, it definitely, because here I feel confident that otherwise we keep guessing, mm -hmm. is this the correct one? Is this the correct one? But this gives us some confidence in right. starting where to start. Right. And for that matter, I also feel uh, when you have protein uh, SARS CoV uh, 2 binding to ACE2 receptor, you can also think of ACE2 receptor being mutated uh, or, uh, I mean, not mutated, replaced. So you can have uh, now, for example, I showed in the previous case that is. Uh, The one comes from ACE2 receptor. So from such a map, you will know which residues are the inhibitor. Mm -hmm. What kind of a ro role are they? Yeah. Are they coming just as a contact uh, connection, or are they part of a click or something? So you can decide uh, judiciously which one to change in order to get the function. Definitely. Thank you. But somebody has to pay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I have another question. Oh, There's a question from yes. the Ghana. Go ahead. Um, also. It says, thanks for this very nice talk. In terms of the native contacts in proteins, we have several degrees of connectivity. I go backbone, backbone sidechain, and the one percent. I wonder whether the sidechain connectivity in the graph theory is decoupled from the whole set of uh, native contacts. And if so, then one can use it for a dynamic interpretation of information chain. Can you read the last sentence again? Yes. Is this, uh, I can look for you here, I can. Oh, yes. Uh, can you hear us? Can you, you can go ahead and ask, ask question. your question. Um, hi. <laughs> um, so I'm Adolfo Puma, and so it's pretty late here in Poland. But uh, I, I'm very curious about the 
did this approach because normally we deal in native context um, for proteins, the interactions between, let's say, side chains, backbones, backbone, backbone, and, and side chains, side chain. And my question is, Generally, we build the contact map in terms of the interaction in all the system. So if this approach is possible, like in the case of the SARS-CoV, one can use on only this information for, for analyzing, let's say, the conformational change of the protein. This is kind of my question. Uh, definitely, you can do that in the sense that we have divided backbone and then side chain. But even the backbone, we take CR5 issues there so that some connectivity is coming out there. Well, the reason we have not included everything here, it kind of blurs the details here. Our results would still be similar, but then a little more cluttered with the backbone interactions coming in. And in order to do that, we are looking at this. So um, the con you're just looking at contact map, right? Yeah. Uh, con contact, here what we have done is uh, we leave out the uh, first, first one or uh, I plus or minus one, or sometimes I plus or minus one and uh, minus two. Uh, that is mainly because we don't, we didn't want the I plus, I to I plus one interaction which is obvious, you can't change the sequence and therefore it will be there no matter what happens. Um, you, you, you can definitely use that. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, so uh, I can ask you a question. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience here, from Zoom people? Speak up. Okay, if not, please join me to thank Dr. Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah,